Hello and welcome to the lecture on object tracking. Today we will cover single object tracking as well as multiple object tracking. So let's start with a short problem statement. So what does tracking actually mean? So in our case, when we refer to tracking, it means that given a video, we first want to find out which parts of the image depict actually the same object in different frames. That means, for example, that we want to know that this green box here, it's depicting a pedestrian at frame T. And this green box here is depicting exactly the same pedestrian at frame T plus one. So not only we want to actually detect the objects, in this case, the pedestrians, but we also want to make this association between different time frames. So, as I've said, we first want to detect these objects on each frame. So often what we do is we use the detectors that we have studied in the past two lectures as a starting point. So at each frame, I can actually run my detector and I can, I can know which parts of the image are actually interesting and which parts of the image to focus on and to make the association from one frame T to another frame T plus one. So you might ask actually, um, why do we need tracking, right? So we have pretty strong detectors, so I could just detect the objects at each frame of the video and I would be done with it. Well, it turns out that I do need to model the temporal aspect of objects. I need to model how they move in case detection fails, right? This is the first reason why you need tracking. So for example, when the object is going through occlusions, it would be nice to actually have at least an idea of where the object might be through the occlusion, or when there's a viewpoint change, there's a pose change, there is motion blur in the camera, there are illumination changes, so all kinds of artifacts that might actually make uh, our detector fail, so I can no longer detect the object in that frame. Well, in this case, what I can do is I can use tracking to have an idea of where the object might be, given the previous trajectory, for example. And also when there is, for example, a lot of background clutter. So this is another problem that might actually make our detector fail. And the other and most important reason of why do we actually need tracking is because we want to actually reason about the dynamic world. So when we use a detector and when we say there is a car here, there is a pedestrian here, we're not really interested in just knowing that there's a car or a pedestrian in this frame, but we're interested in predicting a trajectory in the future, for example. So let's imagine that we're dealing with the autonomous driving application. We're not only interested in knowing that there's a pedestrian in front of us, but we're interested in knowing whether the pedestrian is, for example, going to cross the street and therefore going to come into the trajectory of the car. So there is this aspect of motion, this aspect of, of modeling the dynamic world and not only the static one, that actually makes tracking really interesting. So in practical terms, so in terms of, of computer vision, of actually dealing with a tracking problem, tracking has actually been formulated in many ways. So you can understand tracking as a similarity measurement. You can understand it as a correlation problem. You can understand it as establishing correspondences between different detectors, uh, between different detections at different uh, frames. And there is actually one, one funny, um, let's say, story in that, that kind of goes around in the computer vision community that um, a young student actually asked um, Takeo Kanade, which is a very famous researcher in computer vision, what were the three most important problems in computer vision? And he replied, correspondence, correspondence, correspondence. And this is essentially because most of the problems in computer vision can be formulated as a correspondence problem. Even if you think about uh, 3D reconstruction problems, tracking, optical flow, many, many, many of these problems are just about matching, are just about establishing correspondences. And tracking is also one of them. So another way to view tracking is through matching, through retrieval, and we will actually see 
some examples of this. And finally, date association, which is something that we will go um, into in the next lecture when we do multiple object tracking with graphs. So tracking is not only the correspondence or matching problem that, that we have just explained, but it's also about learning things about our target. So for example, we want to model our target's appearance and we want to model our target's motion. So you can imagine that a target is defined by both aspects. So if when you're doing, for example, pedestrian tracking, you can imagine that um, a pedestrian moves its own way it's, for example, going into a straight direction. It's not, it's not going to zigzag um, his or her way through the crowd. So you can sort of predict the motion of the pedestrian. It's a, it's a very, very strong cue how the pedestrian moves, but also how he or she is actually dressed, right? So the appearance is also a very, very strong cue to actually tell us which pedestrian um, is, is which on each of the frames that we're analyzing. So appearance is really important for single object tracking, right? So single object tracking focuses on tracking one specific object in any possible scene through any possible pose illumination variation. So having a strong appearance model is very important. And it's also important in multiple object tracking when we want to do re-identification. And we will explain um, what that is in, in this lecture. So another important aspect of a target is actually its motion. So we want to actually be able to predict where the target is going to go. And I've already put the example of the autonomous driving scenario where we want to predict whether a pedestrian is going to cross the path of the car. This is one of the most important um, applications of trajectory prediction, which is something that we will cover in a couple of lectures. So let's start first with the problem of single object tracking or single target tracking. So this is actually the problem of following one object throughout a video sequence. And usually um, this video sequence is filmed so that there are a lot of illumination changes. Also the target goes through a lot of pose changes, for example, if it's a person. So things start to get challenging when one cannot properly have uh, an appearance model that is stable over time. And so we'll see roughly three ways, um, just very, very briefly introduce three ways of doing single target tracking. So one is actually um, to model it, to, to pose it as a matching or correspondence problem. And this is how the tracker go turn actually um, deals with single target tracking. And there is no need to have an online appearance model. The second way of um, performing single target tracking is to actually have um, an explicit appearance model that is updated as the frames come in and as we actually learn how the appearance of the object changes. Um, so this is how MDNet um, does single target tracking. And it's about quickly fine-tuning a little bit the network as the appearance evolves. And the third way is actually to model the temporal motion, to model the temporal state of the object. So to have um, roughly um, an appearance model, which would be essentially a CNN, and then an LSTM that would model how the object is moving throughout the frames. So we start with the first method, go turn, and this is a very simple concept that actually tries to find the same object in two consecutive frames. So we have here uh, what is called a Siamese architecture that is going to process one frame, frame T minus one, into this channel here, and it's going to process the current frame, frame at time T, into another channel that contains exactly the same layers. So this is why it's called a Siamese architecture, and we will go more into detail in this lecture on what a Siamese architecture is. But essentially, the rough idea is that the convolutional layers that process the previous frame and the convolutional layers that process the current frame are exactly the same. So they have exactly the same weights. 
So what this essentially means is that both frames are processed in the exact same way, so we extract the exact same features, and then we have a series of fully connected layers that take in both feature maps from frame t and from frame t minus 1. And essentially what these FC layers do is to compare both frames. So let's see exactly what the input is um, to this Siamese neural network. So essentially we have at the bottom the frame t minus 1. So at frame t minus 1, we already know which object we want to track, in this case the face. And what we can do is actually we can place a bounding box around the object and we can crop so that we have a better appearance model of only the object. So of course it's going to contain a bit of background, but the idea is that you can crop and obtain a very strong prior, a very strong appearance model of the object that you're interested in tracking. So then what you're going to do is you're going to make one assumption you're going to make the assumption uh, on where the object has moved. So, of course, um, you can go to the next frame and say the object has moved to the left, to the right, up and down. You could actually do this if you would have a previous trajectory for the object. But in this case, all I see are these two frames. So, I'm going to assume is that the object has actually not moved. So, the object is very, very close to the position in the previous frame. And so essentially what I can do is I can take my crop region, the exact same bounding box where my object was at frame t minus 1, and crop frame t. So you can see what has happened here, right? The object has moved slightly, but it's still inside the search region. So you can still see the phase that you want to track. And so by making this assumption, that the object has moved slowly, what I can do now is I can allow my fully connected layers to refine the location. So to say, well, I assume the object is in this position, and now all I have to do is look at my features and refine the location, which is, of course, slightly to the left. So with this assumption, it's very, very important um, that you know that this assumption of uh, smooth and slow motion is actually quite restrictive, right? So I'm making the assumption that actually I can use the exact same position at frame t minus 1 to find the object at frame t. And this actually works, of course, if the object is not moving too fast. Um, now, just a note on the architecture, um, as we said, it's a series of convolutions, then we actually concatenate the two feature maps coming from the previous frame and the current frame, and finally we pass them through a series of fully connected layers. There's a trick actually on how to parameterize the output, and you can check the original paper if you're interested in that. So the advantage of this, of this method is that you actually do not require online training. So you can train with any object just to refine bounding boxes. And when you want to actually track an object in real time, you can do this and you don't need to fine tune your network. You can directly go ahead and track. This is why this method is incredibly fast. It's called learning to track at 100 frames per second. So tracking is actually done by comparison, right? So we say, this is the bounding box where I think my object is. I know how my object looks like. And the Siamese neural network is actually going to compare the previous patch with the current patch and actually tell you where the object has moved. Um, now, this is very, very close to the template matching approach that we saw in the first lectures for object detection, right? I mean, you have a template of your object and you're just trying to find the same object in subsequent frames. So this makes everything very fast, but the problem, as we have stated, is that we have a very strong prior motion. So we have a motion assumption that tells us that the object is moving smoothly and it's moving slowly. 
So if the object moves very fast, what is going to happen is that it's going to go out of our search window and therefore we're not going to be able to regress to it because the features in the search window are just going to the pick background. So another interesting work that deals with uh, correspondence is actually an unsupervised way of learning correspondences. And this is actually by assuming that when you track an object and you go forward in time, so for example, you go from frame t minus 2 to t minus 1 to t, it should be the same as when you track the object in the opposite direction. That is when you start at t and then you go backward to t minus 1 and t minus 2. So this is exactly the idea that the authors of this paper, the CEPR 2019, actually use as a learning signal, as a, as a loss. They say, if I start at this point here, at the center of my object, and I want to track my object just by comparison, so same idea as the work that we have just presented, I'm going to find that I can go back in time and track my object, just for example, by regression. Now, once I have reached this frame, t minus 2, what I can do is I can say, well, now I can use exactly the same method to go forward in time, opposite direction. And my assumption is that I should end up at exactly the same place as the one where I started, right? If I have a consistent tracker, then I should end up exactly at this blue point. So wherever I end up, um, this is going to be a point where um, I can actually compute a distance to my starting point and use this as a learning signal, use this to actually compute a loss to train my correspondence um, neural network. So essentially, I'm going to train this neural network in a completely unsupervised way by just saying wherever I start, where I know there is an object, I track it back in time, then I track it forward in time, and I should end up in the same point where I started. If not, I can compute a loss to better train my neural network. So we're not going to go into details on how this is done, but I would actually really recommend you reading this paper because it's a really interesting use of the cycle consistency in time and essentially of uh, the tracking problem. So let's go now into the second way of performing single target tracking. And this is by essentially learning an appearance model of the object and updating this appearance model online as we track the object. So of course, the disadvantage of this is that we need to train the neural network also at test time. So as soon as we want to track an object, we need to build an appearance model and we need to keep updating this appearance model, which means that we're going to need to fine tune our CNN also at test time. So, of course, this means that it's not really suitable for real-time applications because there is this training of the CNN always at test time. But we can uh, do a few tricks. Like, for example, we're going to train only a few layers so that the training at test time is as short as possible and therefore tracking doesn't become too slow. So how the authors of this paper actually propose to do this is to have a series of shared layers which essentially perform feature extraction and then have a series of what they call domain-specific layers or scene-specific layers. And these are the layers that are specific for each target in a scene. And so what they propose to do is essentially they propose to train with a series of sequences, right? Diverse sequences with diverse targets, different targets in each sequence. Again, this is single target tracking. So there is only one object that we're interested in following throughout the sequence. And what they propose to do is actually they propose to have this domain specific layer, one for each sequence. So notice that you have this series of fully connected layers at level six. And we have k of those, one per sequence. And so what they're going to do is they're going to perform backpropagation. They're going to perform the learning 
independently per sequence. So for example, in the case of sequence one, backpropagation is going to go through the fully connected layer six at, um, so the, the first one, the one that is responsible for sequence one, and then it's going to go through um, all the conf layers and all the shared layers. When we go to sequence K, it's going to happen exactly the same. So the shared layers are still going to be updated with gradients from that sequence, but we're going to update, we're going to learn a different domain specific layer. And so another question is, okay, I can train my network with different sequences. Each fully connected layer at level six is trained independently per sequence. But now what happens at test time, right? So at test time, what is going to happen is that I'm going to have a new sequence and this new sequence is going to have a starting point. It's going to have a detection. And the goal is now to detect this object throughout all the frames. So what I can do is I can perform backpropagation. I can fine tune my neural network. I can fine tune only um, the fully connected layer at level six, because this is the one specific for the sequence. But in this paper, they also propose to fine tune a little bit um, the fully connected layers at level four and level five, just to get a little bit more learning power inside the, inside the neural network. So essentially what they say is that all the shared layers have already been trained to perform single target tracking. And the only thing that we need to adapt are the last few layers, which actually encode the appearance of this specific target for this specific sequence. And so essentially how they perform online tracking is they draw a series of target candidates. This happens at frame um, after the second frame. So the first frame is given, right? We need to know which target we want to track. Now we can find the optimal state. So which of these target candidates actually represents our detector. Then collect more training samples. That is positive training samples around the yellow bounding box or around the ground truth. And the blue training samples, the blue boxes are actually negatives. I can fine tune my uh, CNN if I need to, if I see that the appearance has changed enough and then go ahead and repeat for the next frame. So this kind of um, regression from target candidates to the optimal state is, an, you, can, you can see it as an RCNN type of regression where we start with a bunch of proposals, these are the red boxes, and we end up at an optimal state where we have only one box that represents our target. So what are the advantages of MDNet? Well, the, advan the main advantage is that unlike GoTurn, there is no previous location assumption. So if the object would actually move to the opposite side of the image because there has been a for example, a strong camera motion or the object is moving really fast and it's really close to the camera, you could still track it with this method here. While in GoTurn, you would have completely lost it. The fine tuning step is also comparatively cheap. So we can actually use this also for real applications. And it's a very, very strong method that uh, won the visual object tracking challenge in 2015. So this is essentially the main challenge for single target tracking in the computer vision community. Of course, um, the disadvantage is that it's not as fast as go turn. So in this case, we will not go at 100 frames per second. So let's take a look at the third way of performing single target tracking. So this is about separating the spatial domain from the temporal domain. So essentially what this, the authors of this paper propose is actually to use a CRNN to extract visual features from each of the frames of the input sequence and then use an LSTM to actually model the motion, model the evolution of these visual features. And so this method is called essentially ROLO. It comes from recurrent YOLO because it essentially uses the features obtained from a YOLO detector that is applied at each of the frames of the video sequence. 
So essentially, this YOLO detector gives you an idea of where the object might be. And these visual features are then fed into the LSTM, which is processing them to actually output a new location for this particular object. And so essentially what, what is happening inside this architecture is that you get from YOLO a heat map for the object's position. And this heat map is actually fed into the LSTM along with a descriptor of the image. And so essentially what the LSTM is doing is it's updating the position of the target. And since it's an LSTM, it's a recurrent neural network, it can actually roughly model the motion of the target. And so you have both the visual input that is coming from the YOLO, from the image features, the visual features that the YOLO extracts, and also a motion prior that comes from the LSTM, from the predictions that the LSTM have done, has done. So single target tracking is, is a very interesting field, right? There are a lot of works in this field. But in this lecture, we will focus more on multiple object tracking, which is an active research field that we're focusing a lot in the dynamic vision and learning group here at TUM. So in multiple object tracking, we have different challenges. So we have different objects of the same type that we actually want to track. And we focus often on uh, pedestrians, on multiple pedestrian tracking, because uh, pedestrians are very interesting, right? So the, there's tons of interactions in a simple scene like this. There's a lot of occlusions. Appearance of different pedestrians is often very similar. So um, there is a tendency to have pedestrians all dressed, for example, in, in dark clothes. So having a strong appearance model here is often very difficult. So it's quite a challenging problem. And it gets even more and more challenging in these uh, latest sequences that we are actually proposing to the computer vision community in our mod challenge benchmark. So tra multiple object tracking can be rather simple when you have a couple of targets interacting, or it can be as complex as this scene where you have hundreds of people just walking around, occluding each other. And here's when tracking becomes very, very challenging, uh, but also very interesting from a research point of view. So in multiple object tracking, we often follow what is called the paradigm of tracking by detection. So essentially, um, all the algorithms that we will present here, most of them, are going to be based on a set of detections that is actually provided. So you might wonder, well, if we have the detections of all the targets on all the frames, then uh, linking them through time becomes rather easy. But of course, detections are not perfect. So this is the first problem that we have to deal with uh, when we're actually doing tracking by detection. So you might have, for example, here, some false positive, this yellow box or this other yellow box, also false negative. So for example, we're not detecting this pedestrian, which is behind the pole. So of course, things start to become more and more complex when you start having errors, false positives or false negatives. And so the idea of tracking by detection is that once you have a set of detections per frame, that you have found independently for each frames by just applying, for example, YOLO at each of the frames of your video sequence, then your task, the, the actual tracking task, is to find the detections that match from one frame to the next and to form a trajectory. So in this case, you would actually find this, this blue trajectory that depicts the same pedestrian. And of course, now it's not single target tracking, right? So you have to find the trajectory of all pedestrians. And this is where problems start to arise. For example, in this case, where we have a detection that is a false positive, but is very, very close to where our pedestrian, uh, our orange pedestrian was in the previous frame. And so you might here make an association that is actually not correct. And same happens, of course, for when you have a false negative and you're trying here to make an association between this green box at frame T to 
nothing essentially frame t plus one because here there was a false negative so you don't have any detection that actually links to the green box of frame t so these are kind of the problems very very high level the problems that we face when we want to do multiple object tracking with a tracking by detection paradigm so in this case, for example, when we actually um, cannot match a detection, what we typically do is that we ignore this middle frame here, we end the trajectory with this green box, and then we start a new trajectory with the pin box. So this is not ideal, but it allows us to at least recover from our mistakes. And we will also see in this lecture um, methods to actually link this trajectory, the green trajectory, with the pin trajectory by having a strong appearance model. And so there are two types of tracking. So one is uh, online tracking, the other is offline tracking. So by online tracking, what I mean is tracking that is useful for real-time applications. So tracking where you just use the current frame and the previous frame, so you process both of these frames, and you try to track pedestrians with only this very um, short information, so this very local information. So of course, since you just can see two frames, you're prone to drifting, so it's hard to recover from errors and it's very, very hard to recover from occlusions because you cannot look into the future. So actually, if the object becomes occluded, you just have to wait for it to reappear. You cannot look into the future and see whether it has appeared there. So online tracking also includes those methods in which you're not processing two frames at a time, but you can look at the current frame and all the frames in the past. So of course you can create stronger motion models with this because you have the past trajectories, but you cannot correct errors in the past. So it is very important to note that in online tracking, you can just decide for the current frame and then you cannot correct for errors in the past. While in offline tracking, you can look at anything you want, past and future frames, and so you can make better informed decisions. So for example, you can process your video in a batch, looking at, for example, 10 frames, and you can decide what are the trajectories in those 10 frames. So, of course, this is not suitable for real-time applications. This is more for video analysis when you're trying to uh, analyze a scene that has already happened. You're trying to understand what happened there. You're trying to understand, for example, um, behavior analysis in, in a certain scene. How do people use entrances and exits to better understand um, whether the layout for the scene is correct for the flux of people that are going in and out? but it's not suitable for real-time applications. Now, the good thing, of course, about processing a batch of frames is that you can make a decision for all the frames. So if there is an occlusion in the middle, you can still see the pedestrian at the beginning and at the end of the batch. And so you're more likely to actually recover from short occlusions that happen within the batch. So it is very important to make this distinction. So let's see how we could perform online tracking with a paradigm of tracking by detection. So first we have to start at frame T. So remember that this is online tracking, so we can not look into the future yet. So in the first frame, frame T, what we do is we first run our detector. So we have to somehow initialize our trajectories or our tracks, and we're going to do this with a detector. For example, if we're interested in tracking pedestrians, people, we're going to train a detector to give us those type of objects from an image. So we start, we initialize our trajectories with our detector. So once the next frame comes in, frame t plus 1, what we can do is we can predict the next position for each of the objects. So if we have been tracking these objects for a while, we can use the motion model that we have assuming that the previous motion that the object has is also the same motion that it will have in the future. If we have just started this trajectory at frame t, then we can assume, for example, that the bounding box has not moved. 
So once we have these predictions for the next position, these yellow boxes, what we do is we run the detector also at frame t plus 1. And now what we have is essentially a set of predictions and a set of detections. And the only thing that I have to do is actually I have to match them. So I have to match the um, yellow boxes with the red boxes. And I can do this, for example, with an appearance model. So whatever appearance is contained inside the yellow box has to be the same as the appearance contained in um, the red box. So let's look a bit more in detail at the second step. So the step where I'm actually predicting the next position. This essentially means building a motion model of the track of the target that I actually want to follow. And the classic way of doing this is um, using a Kalman filter. But nowadays, uh, a lot of people use a recurrent architecture to actually build this motion model. So basically learning the motion model directly in a data-driven way. So for now, what we will actually assume is we will assume a constant velocity model. And it turns out that for really high frame rates, that means that my object is moving just a bit between frames. And if there are no occlusions, this assumption is actually very, very powerful and works really well. So once we have our predictions, now the third step was to match the predictions with detections, for example, using an appearance model. But there are other ways to actually use this. So essentially what we want to do is we want to create a measurement that actually tells us how similar the set of detections that we have for frame t plus 1 are with the predictions that are coming from the motion model and our detections at frame t. So essentially we want to have a similarity measure between these two sets, between detections and predictions. Now we can use several measures. We can define, for example, distances between boxes. We can define pixel distance. We can define 3D distance if we have 3D information. We can even measure IOU, intersection over union, between detection boxes and prediction boxes. And the idea here is that the smaller the distance, the more likely it is that I'm going to match the detection with the prediction. Of course, pixel distance, what measures, or let's say the assumption that I have to make in order to use pixel distance as, as a distance between detection and prediction, is that my target has moved as I expected. So if my target has moved as I expected, as my motion model said it would, then the distance, the pixel distance between my prediction and my detection is going to be really small. So essentially what I do is I collect all of these distances. So you can see here that we have small distances between the detections that are supposed to correspond to our predictions. For example, red detection with red prediction or green detection with green prediction. But what I have to do is I have to make one matching for all the set of detections and all the set of predictions. So of course I cannot match the green detection with both the green prediction and the orange prediction. I need to have a one-to-one -one matching. And for this, what I can do is I can find a unique matching, so this one-to-one -one matching, with, for example, the Hungarian algorithm, which is one way to solve the bipartite matching problem. So in this Hungarian algorithm, what it's going to give us is essentially a unique assignment. And in this case, it would be the assignment that is depicted by the red numbers. So it would, in this case, make the correct association of red pedestrian with uh, red detection, sorry, with red prediction, purple with purple, orange with orange, and green with green. And this assignment is actually found by minimizing the total cost of the matching. So again, my assumption is that my prediction is very, very close to my detection. So for example, I can define these similarities as distances between bounding boxes. So the lower the distance, the better. So the more similar my detection is to my prediction. So what I'm interested in doing when I'm actually solving the bipartite matching problem 
is finding the assignment that minimizes the total cost. That is the total values that I'm going to take from this matrix as the ones being um, the ones that represent my assignment. So the lower the value of the total um, of the summation of all the values that I'm taking for my assignment, the better. I'm trying to minimize this function here. And again, this I can do with algorithms like, for example, the Hungarian algorithm. So it's very, very common in, in object tracking to use the Hungarian algorithm. So now the question is, um, well, what happens if, for example, we're missing a prediction, right? So the case before was very easy because we had four detections, we had four predictions, and there was a clear correspondence between detections and predictions. But what happens, for example, if we're missing a prediction? We cannot make a proper prediction because our motion model failed, for example. Or um, no prediction is suitable for the match. For example, for the orange detection, if we would have that the similarity is 0.5 with the red one, 0.4 with the purple one, and 0.7 with the orange prediction, so all the distances are really large and there is no really suitable prediction for this match. What do we do? I mean, we prefer not to assign any prediction to this detection or do we prefer to assign a wrong one? In this case, for example, we would assign the purple prediction with the orange detection. So in order to solve both of these problems, missing predictions, missing detections, or um, distances which are too large and therefore no predictions or no detections suitable for the match, what we're going to do in order to solve both of these problems is to actually introduce extra nodes. And what these extra nodes have is they are assigned a value which is going to be our threshold cost. So by threshold cost, I mean that if there is an assignment, for example, for the orange detection, you see the orange detection has all values which are larger than our threshold. And again, we're trying to solve a minimization problem. So the lower the values, the better. So what this threshold cost is actually telling us is that if there is no prediction with a cost that is lower than our threshold cost, then we're not going to match the detection with anything. And we're going to do this by including these extra nodes with this threshold cost. So in practice, what happens once we introduce these, um, these extra nodes is that when I actually apply my Hungarian, I'm going to have the following matches. So I'm going to have the red detection match with the red prediction, the purple detection match with the purple prediction, but the green detection and the orange detection are not going to be matched with anything. So, of course, these two predictions are already taken. So the only possibility for both the green detection and the orange detection would be to be matched to the orange prediction. Now, the cost for those matches is pretty high, 0 0.8 and 0 0.7. So we would rather match them essentially with nothing, with this extra nodes, which we sometimes call virtual nodes, which actually contain or represent no prediction. Still, the Hungarian uh, algorithm just sees this matrix, right? It has no idea that these nodes represent predictions and these nodes are virtual nodes. So what it tries to do is it tries to perform matching. It tries to solve this problem by actually matching all the elements in the row with all the elements in the columns. And essentially what happens then is that the orange detection and the green detection are matched to virtual nodes. This means that they're matched essentially to nothing. So these two detections are now free to be matched to no prediction. So essentially this is a small trick that we do in case we have not all the predictions complete or not all the detections or we actually want to introduce a threshold because we want our matches to be really, really accurate. And if, for example, the orange detection is not really sure who should be matched to, then 
better to be matched to virtual node than to a potentially wrong prediction. So let's move now into the question, um, what is the role of deep learning in online tracking, right? So how could we actually leverage deep learning to improve online tracking? So for step one of online tracking that we have seen, for tracking initialization, we have already seen that deep learning is actually a very powerful tool for object detection. So better object detectors have provided us with better tracking initialization. So the whole starting point of tracking has improved a lot as detectors have been improved by deep learning. So this is actually clear. Now the second step, prediction of the next position, so building a motion model. Well, it turns out that deep learning is going to be very helpful there. Uh, we're going to add a lot of temporal complexity to our motion model. And actually, the topic of trajectory prediction will be covered in Lecture 6 extensively. So for now, we're not going to discuss how to build this motion model with deep learning. Now, on the third step, when we actually want to match the predictions with the detectors, we can go in two ways. We can, first of all, improve the appearance model. That is, improve the values that we input into our Hungarian algorithm. Now, these values can be simply the distance between bounding boxes, as we have seen, or they can be more complex values. For example, a value that determines how similar in appearance my detections and my predictions are. So this is often referred to as the problem of re-identification, and we will actually see how deep learning can help us in re-identification in a few slides. And essentially what we're doing there with deep learning is we're adding feature complexity. We're giving it more power to the feature extraction to build more complex appearance models. So once we have improved our features, when we have improved the values that we're putting into our matching matrix, what we can do is improve the matching itself, so add some computational complexity. So for now, the matching, the actual Hungarian algorithm, happens separately from the learning, the learning of the features, the learning of the values that we're going to put inside our Hungarian algorithm. But we will see actually how to couple both steps in the next lecture, when we're actually posing the multiple object tracking problem as a graph problem and using graph neural networks in order to obtain some solutions from that. In the next few minutes, I want to introduce a baseline that we actually published in ICCV 2019 called Tractor. And essentially what we're trying to do here is we're trying to break down tracking in order to make it as simple as possible. So we will start by looking, uh, by looking again at two-step detectors. So if you remember how two-step detectors work, uh, you have an input image, you process that image with a series of convolutions, with a convolutional neural network, until you get a feature representation. Now from that feature representation, we're not really interested in the whole image, therefore in the whole feature representation but we're rather interested only in a potential part of the image that can contain objects. And this is what is called region proposal. And as you will remember, what we end up doing in practice is we end up looking at the part of the feature map that represents this region proposal. And from then on, using ROI pooling, what we do is we place a classification head and a regression head on top. The classification head gives us the likelihood of the semantic labels for that uh, particular region proposal, in this case for the labeled person. And the regression head is the one that actually changes the box to better fit the object. So in this work, what we said is, well, this, this regression head has some interesting properties, right? So essentially what it does is it takes a box that is not really well positioned. So it could be that uh, a region proposal is not really tied around the object. And what the regression head does is it changes this box. It regresses this bounding box so that it better fits the object. So now this is a very interesting property, right? And you can imagine that we can actually use this for tracking. 
So the whole point of our work was actually to ask the question, can we actually use a detector? Can we actually train a detector, but use it as a tractor? Therefore, as a method that has tracking capabilities. So essentially how we're going to do this is we're going to use the regression head for a slightly different purpose. So let's say we find ourselves at frame t plus 1. We have already been tracking these three objects for a while. And so we know exactly where these objects were at frame t, so one frame before. So you see that the objects have now moved, so the bounding boxes of frame t are not really well positioned. So what we're going to do is we're going to discard the region proposal network and we're going to use the detections of frame t as proposals for frame t plus 1. What happens then is we simply use the bounding box regression, so same regression as, for example, faster RCNN. And what this is going to do is it's going to regress the bounding boxes so that they snap to the new position of the objects, right? This is what a classic bounding box regression would do. I know you might ask, well, I mean, is, the, is this really tracking, right? So the question here is, if we can answer the question, where did a detection with ID1, in this case, the red detection, where did it go in the next frame? Can we actually answer this question? So we do have the bounding box for the red pedestrian at frame t and the regressed bounding box at frame t plus 1. So effectively, we know exactly where the red box went from frame t to frame t plus 1 because we just regressed it. Therefore, we can actually answer this question and therefore we can do tracking. So essentially what we're saying is that with the bounding box regression of a detector, we can actually do tracking. So, of course, this is a super simple um, tracker, so it's going to have some advantages and disadvantages. The main advantage is that we have extremely well-trained regressors from the detection algorithm, so faster CNN and so on. And we can actually reuse them. We don't even need to retrain them. We can just fine tune them a little bit for a specific class that we're interested in. And we automatically get very well positioned bounding boxes. And as we will see in the next lecture, um, the metrics of multiple object tracking, the metrics used to measure the accuracy of multiple object tracking algorithms, actually rely a lot on intersection of reunion of bounding boxes. So getting well positioned bounding boxes is a big plus for getting good tracking results. Another advantage is that since we're essentially training a detector, we can train our model on still images. So the annotation is much easier. Now you don't need to really annotate hundreds of frames inside a video, but you can just annotate a still image and use the faster CNN type of training to actually train the regression also. And the third advantage, of course, is that this is an online method. So it's actually quite fast. We just need to do a forward pass. We don't even need to go through the region proposal network. And therefore, Tracted is uh, a fully online method. So of course, such a simple method needs to have also some cons. So as you might have noticed, um, the method is not really a tracking method in the sense that it doesn't have any notion of identity. So for example, in crowded spaces, what the model is going to do is it's just going to snap to any pedestrian that is nearby. So any pedestrian that is close to my proposal, it's just gonna snap to it. It doesn't really care if the pedestrian was the same as the previous frame. Another disadvantage is um, a disadvantage that actually any online tracker has and that is that if the track is killed when the target becomes occluded, then we cannot really recover that identity anymore. So we need some sort of separate algorithm to close small gaps and occlusions. It's not really enough to use tractor because as soon as there is an occlusion, the track has to become killed. 
Now, fortunately for us, there has been quite a lot of research in a subfield of tracking, which is called re-identification, um, in which algorithms are actually developed so as to find out whether two detections, two bounding boxes, actually depict the same person. So the idea is that you can re-identify that person even if the person has moved to another camera, for example, to another position in the scene. So we can actually use those methods um, to solve these two disadvantages of the tractor model. Now there's a third disadvantage, and that is the one that um, the regressor actually only shifts the box by a small quantity. So the regressor is trained just to refine bounding boxes, and if you train the regressor to shift by a bigger quantity, then you start getting a lot of instabilities. So essentially we have a problem when we have large camera motions, because then not only the pedestrian has moved, but also the camera has moved. So it is very possible that in image space, the bounding box has moved by quite a large number of pixels. Essentially, this means that we will not be able to regress the bounding box of position T to the bounding box of position T plus 1. And the same happens if we actually have a low frame rate in our video and our targets are moving fast. Then we're going to have automatically large displacements in the, in the image space. But again, fortunately for us, um, a lot of tracking methods actually use powerful motion models in order to compensate uh, for both of these problems. So a motion model essentially is going to tell us first how the camera is moving and second, what kind of motion can we expect from a pedestrian. So essentially what we're doing is we're kind of anticipating the future. So we have a better estimate for where our region proposal, where our bounding box should be. Now once we have these motion models and we apply them to the bounding box, it is more likely that this bounding box is very, very close to the pedestrian that we're actually trying to track, and therefore regression is going to work at that point. So as you can imagine, there's actually um, a lot of work in VID and a lot of work in a motion model, in, in predicting motion models of pedestrians and of, and of, the, of the camera. And essentially what ReID boils down to is in modeling the appearance of pedestrians. And motion model is the opposite. So it wants to ignore the appearance and it wants to model just the motion of a pedestrian. So again, we're going back to these concepts of modeling appearance and modeling motion. And these are going to be, again, key concepts in order to solve the tracking problem. So let's start with the first one. Let's start with um, modeling the appearance. How can we actually model their appearance and how can we actually do re-identification of pedestrians? So in re-identification, uh, what researchers are doing is they're changing the problem statement of multiple object tracking. So essentially what they do is they view tracking as a retrieval problem. And by retrieval, I mean that I'm going to have a gallery here marked by this, by this oval circle where I have images of different identities. And this is essentially the data set of identities that is known to me. Then what's happening is that I have a camera and I detect a person, for example, this yellow box in camera one. And now what I do is I go and look at my gallery and say, can I find the same person in my gallery? So can I re-identify that person that I found in camera one? Can I re-identify it within the images of my gallery? And so what I do is I essentially retrieve the top images that I consider to be most similar to my query image. And so in order to do all of this process, and especially in order to do the retrieval part, I have to measure, I have to learn what is the distance between two images. And of course, one could use the distance between RGB pixels, but of course, that is not the whole information. So there is more to an identity than just a distance of RGB 
uh, values. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to cast this question, this question of learning distance between images, as essentially a learning problem. So I first start by saying, okay, what if I use classification, right? I know how to perform classification. I know how to train a neural network for classification. And I decide to do this by essentially extracting a set of attributes from an image and then comparing these attributes and seeing actually whether this image represents the same identity or not. So in this case, I have two images here. I can extract all kinds of attributes, like for example, person, face, female, brunette, or blonde. And I can actually start comparing these attributes. The question, of course, is how many attributes do I need? And what happens if two different identities start having the same attributes and I need to go to a finer and finer scale? But what if I'm just interested in answering the question whether this is the same person or not? I don't really care about the attributes and I don't want to actually label all those attributes. I just want to label a very simple general attribute, which is these two pictures do not depict the same person. So this actually opens up um, another type of problems, which uh, can be called similarity learning. Therefore, learning a function that measures how similar two objects are, or also called deep metric learning, in which case we're actually learning a distance function over objects. So this is actually the type of learning that we want to use in this case, and it's going to be preferable um, over, for example, classification. So, okay, let's see um, an application that most of you have on your phones, and let's see how similarity learning can help there. So in this case, we have this, uh, the application that we want to unlock um, an iPhone with your own face, right? Um, so this is a very, very simple application because we can just gather training data from one person, right? So typically, a phone um, just has one user and you just want to unlock it with one face. So the only thing that you need to do is gather a bunch of images of yourself in different poses, different illumination, different hairstyles, and train a model with your face so that it can recognize you. So in this case, testing is going to be very easy, right? So a new face, let's say face A, appears in front of the phone. And now what I can do is I can test it, I can compare it with my model. And I can say, well, if face A comes um, in front of the phone, then yes, the phone is unlocked. If face B comes in front of the phone, then the phone is not unlocked. So for this particular application, we don't really need similarity learning because we just have one category and we just need to answer the question yes or no. So we can actually solve this problem as a classification problem. So let's see another type of application. Let's see if um, a classification problem, um, or let's see if we can pose this, this application, this task, as a classification problem. So let's imagine that we have a face recognition system. We want to actually build a face recognition system so that when you are actually entering an exam room, we don't really need to check for an ID. So we can essentially recognize your identity from the face and let you in if you register the exam or raise a red flag if you're not. So what I can do is, um, well, I can go about this problem the same way that I um, solved the iPhone unlocking, which means I'm gonna gather training data for all the people registered in the exam. So I ask person one to send some images, I ask person two to send some images, so on and so forth, until I have collected images for everyone registered in the exam. Then I essentially train a model which has n outputs for the n students registered in the exam. And I can go about testing the same way as I did before. So this would also be posing the problem as a classification problem. So what is the problem with this approach? And I, I actually recommend you to pause the video and think about this for a few seconds. So actually, the problem with this approach is that it's not really scalable. So 
every time a new student registers, we need to retrain our whole model. So imagine that someone registers last minute, then we would have only, for example, a couple of hours to actually retrain our neural network so that it would contain and identify this new student. And again, for every semester, we would need to collect images of registered students, train our neural network, so on and so forth. So there's a huge scalability problem. And this is especially important if you're dealing with applications, not only student registration, but for example, face recognition systems for uh, a company that is constantly adding new, new workers um, to the company and actually wants to use face recognition to, for example, let them in. So scalability is a huge issue, but the question now is, okay, what if I don't pose this problem as a classification problem? Can I pose it as another type of problem and train only one model and use it every year? Doesn't matter how many students are actually registered at the exam or who is registered at the exam. So it turns out we can do this if we use similarity learning. So instead of posing this as a classification problem, I'm going to pose it as a similarity learning problem. So essentially what I want to do is um, when I receive two images of a different identity, I want to assign a low similarity score, therefore a large distance. And I when, re when I receive an image of the same identity, two images of the same identity, then I want to assign them a high similarity score. That is a small distance. So at, if I can actually train such a neural network, then at test time, what I can do is I can simply threshold my distance. So I can say, if the distance between A and B is large enough, larger than a threshold, then I consider these two images to be not the same person. And if, on the other hand, the distance between images A and B, as I have learned with my neural network, is below a threshold, then I can consider these two images to be representing the same person. So another question is, okay, how, how can I actually use this for image retrieval and for re-identification? Well, the first thing that I need to do is I need to gather um, the images of my gallery, right? This is going to be representing what is called the database images. And then I take my query image, this new um, pedestrian image that I obtained from camera one, and I need to compute the distance between the query image and the database image. So once I have all the distances, the only thing I need to do is use k nearest neighbor and essentially extract the top k images that are closest to my query image based on the distance that I have just learned. So now the question is, how do we train such a network? How do I train a neural network to learn similarity? So let's say that I have my image A. Um, I first process it with a CNN, right? I want to have some kind of representation. So I want to condense all the information of the face into, for example, 128 values. And these 128 values are going to be the learned representation, the learned features that actually represent my face. Now, once I get another image B, what I want to do is I want to extract, again, a representation for this image. But the key trick is that I want to do the exact same extraction as before. So I want to process image A and image B in an exact same way. So essentially, I want to be able to use the same function F to find a representation for image A and to find a representation for image B. And it turns out that I can actually do this in one step if I use what is called a Siamese neural network. So essentially Siamese, um, or the name Siamese is because I'm using these, these two channels to process the two images in parallel. And these two heads have exactly the same weights. So the weights of the neural network that is processing image A and the weights of the neural network that is processing image B are exactly the same weights. 
And so this whole architecture is called a Siamese neural network. And we're going to train both heads at the same time and update the weights so that they essentially agree with each other. So it is very important to use the exact same network to obtain an encoding of the images f of a and f of b so that we can then compare it, right? So the whole thing is that the, the whole objective of similarity learning is we want now to compare these two encodings and see how far they should be depending on whether a and b represent the same image or not. So essentially now the only thing that we need to do is we need to define our loss function. So first of all, we need to define a distance function between f of a and f of b. We can take, for example, uh, the L2 loss here. And now what I want to do is I want to learn the parameters of my neural network such that if a and b depict the same person, then the distance between these two images has to be small. And if A and B depict a different person, then the distance between A and B is going to be large. So essentially what I'm training here is I'm training the parameters of my neural network. I'm training the parameters of F such that these distances are small or large depending on whether A and B depict the same person or not. So this is essentially what I do, right? So I have a different loss function if A and B depict the same person and another loss function if A and B depict a different person. So when A and B actually depict the same person, I want D to be small. So I can define the loss function simply as D, as the distance between F of A and F of B. And I'm going to minimize this loss function. Therefore, if A and B depict the same person, then what I'm essentially going to do is to minimize the L2 distance between them. But what happens when we actually have a negative pair? So when A and B depict a different person, then what we need our loss to represent is that D of A and B is actually large. We want to maximize the distance between F of A and F of B. And so what I'm going to use in this case is going to be a hinge loss. So the hinge loss has this shape. It's going to be the maximum between 0 and this expression m squared minus the distance between a and b. Now m is going to be what is called a margin. And essentially what this whole expression does is it brings f of a and f of b far away up until that margin. So how this works is um, I start with the, with the loss function and f of, a, f of a and f of b are far apart, but not too far. Let's say that the distance is smaller than m squared. Then this whole expression here is going to be positive. And therefore, when I do the maximum between 0 and this expression, what we're going to have is a loss function. And this loss function is going to be larger the smaller d is, which is what we're interested in, right? So for a small d, I have a large loss function. I really want to correct that. And so essentially what's going to happen is I'm going to enlarge the distance between f of a and f of b. f of a and f of b are going to become further and further away up until they hit the margin m squared. After that, this whole expression is going to become negative. So if the distance between f of a and f of b is larger than m squared, then this whole expression becomes negative. At that point, what happens with the hinge loss is that when we do the maximum between this negative value and zero, then our loss is zero. So essentially, once f of a and f of b are far, far away enough, depending on the margin, of course, then our loss is going to be zero, which means that we're not going to spend any learning energy. We're not going to put any gradients into pulling them even further apart. So it's kind of an energy saving that tells us if f of, f of a and f of b are already far enough, so my neural network has already pulled them far enough, let's not spend any more energy and any more parameters in pulling them even further apart. 
And then we can concentrate on the cases where f of a and f of b are still within the margin. So essentially, if we put together the loss for the positive pairs and the negative pairs, we obtain what is called the contrastive loss. So here we have the positive pair where the goal is to actually reduce the distance between the elements, reduce the distance between f of a and f of b. And here we have the negative pair where we actually want to bring the elements, we want to bring these encodings f of a and f of b further and further apart up to a margin m, which is a hyperparameter in this case. So contrastive loss is one way to train a neural network for similarity le learning, but there's actually a better way, and that is using the triplet loss. So the triplet loss not only looks at pairs of images and then decides whether to pull them together or apart, which is what the contrastive loss is doing, but the triplet loss actually looks at three images at a time, and what it allows us to do is it allows us to learn a ranking between these images. So typically the three images are called anchor, positive, and negative. And the idea of the triplet loss is that we want the distance between f of a and f of p, that is between the representation of the anchor and the representation of the positive image, to be smaller than f of a and f of n. That is, the anchor should be more similar to the positive image than to the negative one. I don't care exactly how far apart the positive and the anchor are, or the positive, um, sorry, the anchor and the negative. I just care that the anchor and the positive are closer than the anchor and the negative. So essentially, we're learning to rank images. So the question now is how can I convert this expression, the expression of what I want to achieve, into a loss function? So first of all, I'm going to play around a little bit with the term. So I'm going to take um, the distance between a and n, and I'm going to bring it to the left-hand side of the equation. And I'm also going to use a margin for the same exact purposes as I used it in the contrastive loss. And so what I can do now is I can use a hinge loss with the margin and with this whole expression that I have here. And this roughly looks uh, like this. So we have the maximum between zero and this whole expression that I had here on the left hand side. So the idea here is that this whole expression should be below zero. This is essentially the condition that I want here. So if this whole expression is below zero, is negative, I'm going to have actually a loss of zero. And this is exactly what I want, right? So a loss of zero means that I have learned all that I have to learn. And in this case, if this whole expression would be above zero, then my loss would be positive and I would still be training my neural network. So essentially what I can get from this loss function is that if the distance between the anchor and the positive is larger than the distance between anchor and negative, then the loss is going to be positive, right? So you can imagine this distance is large, this distance is small, so the whole expression is definitely positive. So we're going to have here a positive loss function, and I'm going to train to reverse that trend. What I want to get to is that the distance between anchor and positive is actually smaller than the distance between anchor and negative. So if this happens, this means that essentially this value is larger than this value. So this overall expression here all the way up to m is going to be negative. Now if it's negative enough, if it's more negative than a value m for example, then it means that I have a safe distance between a and p and a of n. So a and p is um, smaller than a of n plus m. So I'm essentially separating the distance between anchor and positive and the distance between anchor and negative, and I want to separate it I, at least 
by the quantity that the margin is expressing. Once this happens, then the loss goes to zero. So it is often the case that we actually train the triplet loss with what it's called the hard cases. So I essentially train my neural network for a few epochs with randomly selected triplets. And then what I do is I want to start refining the distance function. And for this, what I can do is I can choose what is called the hard cases. So the cases where even after training the network for a few epochs, the distance between A and P is still very, very similar to the distance between A and N. So what I then do is I choose only those cases as triplets, and I train only with those to actually refine the distance that I've learned. And actually, hard negative mining, which is this technique, is, has been proven to be very powerful to improve the performance of similarity learning networks. So essentially what the triplet loss is going to do, again, in a, in a more visual way, is if the distance between the anchor and the negative is smaller than the distance between anchor and positive, so essentially anchor and negative are closer together, what we're doing with the triplet loss is we're pulling the negative far away from the anchor and at the same time pulling the positive closer to the anchor. Right? It doesn't really matter what this distance actually is. The only thing I want is that the positive comes closer to the anchor and the negative than the negative. So I don't want to push the negative arbitrarily further away. Once the positive is closer and at a safe margin distance from the negative, then I'm done training for this particular triple. So, of course, there are problems with all losses, and there are problems with uh, the contrastive loss and the triplet loss that I've just presented. So, the first problem is that the number of pairwise relations in a mini batch is actually O of n squared, if n is the number of elements in the mini batch. But the contrastive loss is only going to consider n half relations, and the triplet loss typically is only to consider. 2n divided by 3 relations. So essentially, it is too expensive to consider all the relationships between the elements in the Bina batch. And so what we have to do in practice is, with the contrastive loss and also with the triplet loss, just throw away information. We cannot really consider all possible triplets. So in order to train these networks to really achieve the results that you will see published in, in papers and in, in top conferences, um, you actually have to do many tricks. Um, you have to do hard negative mining, which we have discussed, but also other tricks like intelligence sampling or multitask learning. And we have put at the end of the slides of this lecture some papers for you to read in case you're interested in actually going deeper into these matters. But there is an alternative to the contrastive and the triplet loss. And that is a work that we have been doing recently. We just published this and it's called the group loss. So let's see briefly how this works out. So in group loss, we actually want to take into account the similarity of all the samples with respect to all other samples in a mini batch. So no more choosing pairwise distances or choosing triplets. We actually want to take the similarity of all samples into account. So within a mini batch, I'm going to compare a sample with all the other samples in the mini batch. That is essentially the goal of group loss. So you can see here a depiction on the right that is the triplet loss that takes only into account the relationship between anchor positive and negative. And what we actually do is we take all the elements of the MIDI batch, we compute their embeddings, and in a process that we call the group loss, we actually compare everyone with everyone. So the whole training procedure consists on three steps. The first step is actually to define the initialization. And here we're going to do a slightly different thing from uh, the contrastive loss or triplet loss. 
And this is because we're actually going to use a classification loss. So we're going to assign a label to each image. Now, again, the goal is not really to improve classification, but to improve the embeddings enough so that we can actually do similarity learning. So we're going to first initialize this image label assignment with whatever output our neural network gives us. So the neural network pre-trained gives us first a softmax output that tells us what is the initial image label assignment. So this is going to be the assignment that is going to be contained in the matrix X. And then we're going to compute a pair with similarity matrix W, which basically looks at the similarity between all samples. And so we have n samples in the mini beds, and so this matrix is going to have a size n by n. Now in the second step, and this is the interesting thing, we're going to refine X. So we're going to refine our image label assignments by considering the similarities between all the mini batch images. So essentially, we're going to refine X using the information encoded in W. So here the idea, roughly the intuition, is that if I have two very similar images, so the W tells me, matrix W tells me that these two images are very similar, it is very likely that they also have the same label so I can actually find X considering the similarities in W. If I have two birds in two images and one bird is classified as bird, but the other is classified as table, then maybe X can be refined by looking at the other bird, seeing that it's a very similar image, and therefore it is very likely that both images should have the same label. So in a third step, I compute my laws. So again, we're going to use a classification loss. So we're going to use the cross entropy loss of the refined probabilities to finally update the weights of the neural network. So the training of the neural network is essentially the training of a classification network. Now the trick here is the refinement part. And this is what is really going to improve my embeddings and it's going to allow me to perform similarity learning. So this refinement step, as I said, is the important one. And uh, here we see step one, again, depicted in which we compute our priors coming from the softmax and our similarity matrix W. And we fit both of this into our step two or the refinement procedure. So let's look into more detail into an example of the refinement step. So in this case, I have three images, A, B, and C, depicting three objects, and four classes, one, two, three, four. Now, the first thing that I can compute is image similarities, and these are depicted in the matrix W. And what I see from here is that B and C are much more similar than A and C. So then I go to my label prior. So let's say that my neural network is, has been pre-trained and it's actually quite sure that image A is of class one and image B depicts class two. But it has no idea what kind of class can we assign to image C. So basically, there's a uniform distribution for image C. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to mix the information of my priors and the similarities between images A, B, and C of my mini batch. And so in the first iteration, what I do is I look at the similarities and I see, of course, that B and C are much more similar than A and C. So what this essentially does is it increases the probability that B and C are actually assigned the same label, label number two. So you have seen here that the label two has been increased. The probability of getting this label has been increased. And this is an iterative process. So this label propagation, this propagation of information actually happens in different iterations. So I refine my probabilities in iteration one, iteration two, and by iteration three, it is pretty clear that C is going to get the same label of B. And this was only because the similarity between B and C was actually really high. And so mathematically how this works is uh, we're going to use what is called the replicator dynamics. And the replicator dynamics is essentially this iterative process of 
propagating information. So I'm going to have this propagation of information here at the top. The bottom is just a normalization, and you can see here that we go from time step t to t plus 1. So this is an iterative process. And essentially, the, the element pi is going to indicate the similarity between um, i and j. So between essentially um, the element i, which is the one that I'm analyzing, to all the other elements, right? So here I have the input, the, the prior for all the other elements for a particular class, right? So what I'm looking at here is I'm looking at all the other elements in the mini batch and their relationship with a particular class. And then I take these priors Right, the priors that all of these elements are classified as class lambda, and I multiply all these priors by the similarity between the element i, which is the one that I'm analyzing, and all the other elements in the mini batch. So essentially, I'm doing a weighted sum of all the other probabilities. So essentially, if I'm very, very similar to another image, and that image has a very high probability of being classified as class lambda, then the value of pi i lambda is also going to be increased. So essentially, pi i lambda measures the support, the support that the current mini batch gives to the image i for belonging to class lambda. So does the mini batch agree that image i depicts the class lambda. This is essentially the, the value, what this uh, pi value actually represents. And so once, once this uh, iterative process is, is going further and we actually share information across all of the elements of the mini batch, then we can compute our loss function and backpropagate. So the loss function, as I've said, is a simple cross-entropy and we're going to backpropagate over the entire net. Now, the refinement step actually has no parameters, so the refinement step is a fixed operation, but it does propagate the gradients over the network. So the network does see the effect of the refinement step. And the result of all of this process is that we can actually obtain state-of-the-art results in retrieval, in, um, also could be applied actually to VAD, and it's much, much more powerful than the contrastive loss or the triplet loss. So, okay, what, what have we actually seen in this lecture? So we have seen a lot of online tracking. We know that we can build better appearance models with similarity learning with what is called ReID. And what we're going to see in the next lectures is first um, about offline tracking. So taking into account more than two frames, taking into account past and future frames, and this is going to allow us to, of course, recover from errors much more easily than if we're doing online tracking. And for this, we're actually going to spend a whole lecture into how to cast the multiple object tracking problem as a graph problem. So essentially uh, using graphs to actually solve the multiple object tracking problem. And we're going to discuss then in lecture six about motion models. So we know how to obtain now better appearance models, but how about improving motion models? And this is going to be explained in lecture six, where we're going to do uh, trajectory prediction with generative adversarial networks. Thank you so much for attending this lecture on object tracking. Stay tuned for the next lecture.